At the heart of it, a large language model, or LLM, is just two files. The first file is like about 500 lines of C language code. The second file is just hundreds of billions or trillions of seemingly random numbers, the parameters. But this is where the magic happens. Based on current evaluations, which have their shortcomings, yes, the more parameters the model has, and the more tokens they are trained on, the more capable they get. The models themselves are economically valuable. They carry proprietary trade secrets and, when separated from their safety systems, can exhibit malicious capabilities. The data that help train those models is also valuable. Nowadays, good and useful LLM data is produced at considerable cost, often by educated workers. If more and better data creates better models, then there is significant commercial incentive for state actors, smaller and less ethical AI labs, or even just hacktivists to bootstrap their performance by stealing from a leader. What if someone stole GPT-4? We should be talking about this risk. In this video, a few thoughts about protecting these LLMs from theft. This video is brought to you by the Agenometry Patreon. Subscribe, I'd really appreciate it if you do. All right, thanks, back to the show. The first and most defining trait of these LLMs and their training data is that they are extremely large and girthy. That size defines their cybersecurity profile. In the case of the models, GPT-2 has about 1.5 billion parameters and comes in at over five gigabytes. GPT-3 has 175 billion parameters and is 800 gigabytes. OpenAI hasn't released GPT-4's parameter count, but it is probably over a trillion. Do some crude math and the model easily works out to be a terabyte or two. The training data set for these models are also just as chunk. Common Crawl, the largest publicly available training set on the internet, crawls the web and provides data archives for training. Before compression, the whole archive is about 45 terabytes. For the attacker, the big challenge is getting these big models out the metaphorical door. Exfiltration attack techniques are well studied by cybersecurity professionals. One of the most popular ways for doing it is the attacker encoding the stolen data within sent content. You embed sensitive information within images and video files. The encoded image looks the same as the original thanks to techniques that hide the stolen data inside pixels. You can hide a 50,000 line CSV into a 5 megabyte PNG file, which adds about 21 megabytes to the file size. Zip that and you can easily attach it to an email and send it out to someone. Or important data can be encoded within the headers of an email or within the option fields of the TCP IP protocols, which is used to optimize the connection. The max size that can be encoded is 40 bytes. To prevent these exfiltration activities, companies can employ heuristic scanning to observe the behavior of traffic passing through the network or even look into the data packets themselves, matching against targets and flagging anything suspicious. There have been situations where gigabytes and even terabytes of data have been exfiltrated outside network. It happens. But to be frank, it might take a lot of time and effort to exfiltrate even GPT-3 let alone GPT-4, through email headers. Something else might be needed, and that's where the second major nature of LLMs come into play. If LLMs are to fulfill their promise, then they must be deeply embedded into people's everyday lives. This means wide distribution. Microsoft is really at the leading edge of this, rolling out LLMs across the whole organization with GPT-4-powered products like Microsoft Copilot, Copilot Studio, and so on. Per a comment by CEO Satya Nadella in a recent shareholder conference call, these AI products all run on top of the same core foundation GPT-4 model. Now, because those models are too large for any single GPU machine to store in its secondary memory, it needs to be split up and distributed over two dozen or so GPUs. Regardless, there are a lot of copies of this model floating around inside a data center. Such devices are vulnerable to exfiltration. Data can exist in one of three states. First, the data can be at rest, meaning that it is stored somewhere on a disk doing nothing. Technically, we know how to secure that. 
you can encrypt the data using some very strong encryption algorithm and then split it up into different storage spaces, all of which are isolated from the larger network. Second, the data can be in transit, meaning that it is traveling from the disk to another location, either over the internet or otherwise. The security risks here are greater. For instance, a man in the middle attack as we send the model's data from its providers to the devices we are running it on. But we also largely know what to do for that. The de facto standard for connecting remote machines is SSH or Secure Shell. The transmitter and receiver use automatically generated key pairs to encrypt the connection. The data can also be encrypted before transmission. So for the most part, I think we have widely accepted ways to protect data at rest and in transit. The final state, however, data in use, is one that has not been so much explored. How do we secure the LLM and its data while the model is being used? The work of running these models in the wild is called inference. During such a job, you run the model over and over again, generating and then appending new tokens. During inference, the LLM's data is primarily stored inside the GPU's memory, moving in and out of the register. There, it is often out in the open. Someone with physical access to the GPU can pull out the model's data using a variety of attacks. In a memory bus monitoring attack, the adversary is trying to directly intercept the data as it travels along the memory bus between the GPU's memory and its processing cores. Similar to that is the memory probe, which makes me think of alien abductions or spy movies. This is where the attacker tries to illicitly retrieve the model out of the system's RAM. We never give much thought to the idea of attacking and pilfering valuable data while it is in use because of the fact we need to have physical access to the hardware. Just keep people away from the devices, right? So for the longest time, no one really worked on this problem except for those really concerned about someone pulling out IP from a piece of hardware, most notably the movie studios or game console makers, in other words, DRM. But things have changed. In the era of cloud computing, the model's providers often do not actually own the servers or GPUs that they are running their models on. More likely, they are renting cloud compute time from a third-party vendor like AWS, Microsoft, or Oracle. Often, it is the only way for these smaller companies to gain economic access to otherwise prohibitively expensive AI accelerator hardware. Now, malicious state and non-state actors won't have to breach the lab's actual premises in order to get access to their data and models. They breach the third-party cloud compute centers. One might argue that large cloud providers have more incentive to, are more capable of, and have the resources to follow the best security practices. That is true. But data centers are big organizations. Employees, even low-level ones and temporary workers, can end up with unsupervised access to customer servers, particularly during special and chaotic events like the installing and decommissioning of servers. Protecting data while it is in use is tricky because the most obvious and widely used protections negatively affect performance. For instance, your iPhone has something Apple calls a secure enclave. It is a dedicated subsystem inside the iOS system on chip, creating this trusted environment that runs alongside the main system, but isolated from it. Isolation works, but what people quickly discovered is that marching so much data in and out of isolation creates bottlenecks, and we already have enough trouble running data fast enough through the von Neumann bottleneck. Another way to thwart something like a memory bus monitoring attack is to encrypt the GPU's memory. But if you do that, you substantially hurt latency, sometimes by up to 50%. People already complain about ChatGPT being too slow. If our cybersecurity theft measures restrict performance too much, then the product itself starts losing value. I don't think companies will accept that. I want to do a more detailed dive into the problem of physical access attacks sometime down the line, so stay tuned for that. With all these considerations in mind, it has been interesting to look at a new consortium launched back in 2019, Confidential Computing. The consortium's founding members included Alibaba, Arm, Huawei, Intel, Microsoft, and Red Hat. Google, NVIDIA, Samsung, Meta, and others have since joined. 
The project and community sits within the Linux Foundation. The consortium seeks to bring out hardware-based solutions for handling data in use across multiple environments. At the heart of this solution is what they are calling the Trusted Execution Environment, or TEE. The TEE does two things. First, it can host the application inside an environment isolated from the rest of the hardware, something like the aforementioned secure enclave for the Apple silicon chips. This protects the application from external access by those even with high levels of privilege. The second aspect of the TEE is that it can issue verifiable attestations about the programs running inside itself, kind of like a letter of credit. Outside parties can use them to gain trust in the application, knowing that it has not been compromised. These aspects all extend from a single piece of hardware sitting on the silicon die, the root of trust. It is a standalone module containing the cryptographic keys that enable a secure boot, kind of like the foundation of a building. Everything else flows from there. Most of the first TEEs were for CPUs, first from Intel and AMD, and later ARM produced a specification of their own. These confidential computing CPUs can separate entire virtual machines. Their memory management units are configured with an encryption engine that isolates certain pages of memory. If anything other than the right virtual machine tries to access that memory page, it page faults. GPU adoption of the confidential computing model came later. The A100 had some aspects of confidential compute, but it would not be until the now legendary NVIDIA H100 that the company first provided a confidential compute GPU solution. The H100's memory is split into protected and unprotected parts. When the GPU is in its confidential compute mode, nothing can enter the protected memory area. And programs inside the TEE cannot easily write outside of the protected memory area. This requires the cooperation of the CPU. So if you want to run a confidential workload, then you need to use a compatible CPU that can connect to the GPU and verify its TEE's attestations before starting the workload. Once done, all the communications between the GPU and CPU are now encrypted. Impressively, the H100 can do all of this without a significant loss in performance. In fact, the H100 showed a massive step change up from the prior A100. Many security experts, especially those at AI Labs, have high hopes for confidential computing as a way to shore up what has long been a critical vulnerability. There is a subset of security concerns unique to LLMs and their peculiarities, attackers remotely extracting the model's parameters. The goal is to extract enough information in order to recreate the target LLM. In other words, you're basically training a student model that learns from the master through a series of questions and answers. Many commercial foundation models have API endpoints. The attacker can fire inputs to the API and use the result for the training set building out its student model as time goes on. Now, replicating the whole model might take a long time and many queries. Access to the API might get cut before the attack is complete. But if you know what you want, it does not take a whole lot of data inputs and outputs to get a decent approximation. I read an interesting paper from Lancaster University discussing the concept of model leaching. With this, the researcher selected a specific topic and generated a question and answer dataset using a far smaller LLM, about 100 million parameters. Over the span of 48 hours, they ran 83,335 API requests at the cost of 50 bucks. With just 76,000 valid responses, they were able to generate a model that generated answers with about 75 to 87% similarity to the original model, which was GPT 3.5. Somewhat related to that, you don't even need to extract all the training data to properly attack the LLM. There is a class of attacks that try to determine whether a certain data set is present, assuming that said data was not internally or automatically generated. This type of attack is referred to as a membership inference attack. Since it is known that many LLMs memorize their training data and can spit it back out despite themselves, attackers can craft attacks to pull out snippets. On the basis of AI model theft, 
Knowing the composition of the target model's training data can be enough for another party to replicate that model's performance. You can go buy that data set or scrape it yourself. But membership inference attacks can also be serious data privacy problems. Imagine if we deploy a model to diagnose a particular condition trained on private medical data. The right attack can reveal whether a person's data was included in the training set. And lastly, it can also bring copyright headaches for the LLM provider. It is somewhat of an open secret that training sets are augmented with illegally acquired copyrighted works. The laws around such data use remains murky, but lawsuits have been filed over a certain work being in the data set. Insider attacks are always a concern, particularly when we talk about assets of interest to nation states. When attacking these organizations, nation states are likely to build on current systems of asset recruitment. This means recruiting individuals they have leverage against. These insider attacks have happened. For instance, the FBI's 2019 case that highlighted how the Saudi authorities recruited two Twitter employees to access and pass over internal company information on dissidents. Similarly, I want to call out government distrust about Chinese Americans in academia and government organizations, with stories of individuals being questioned about where their loyalties lie. Insider attacks are a concern, but I want to be clear. America and American companies are strengthened by the contributions of immigrants. Many AI leaders were born in China, have family in China, and are rightfully proud to be Chinese. We want things to be built in America, not necessarily by Americans. I should also note that the 2023 Data Breach Investigations Report released by Verizon notes that 83% of data breaches are instigated by outsiders. The goal for amelioration is through vetting, encryption, and good cybersecurity practices that don't place inherent trust in any individual. The cybersecurity best practices and measures specifically regarding LLMs are still being built out. But if you look at the history, one of the big AI labs, Anthropic, OpenAI, or someone else, will eventually get hacked. All the cybersecurity elites have been hacked at one time or another. The CIA, the Israeli army, the US government, a lot. Everyone. China and Iran won't talk about any attacks, but they probably have suffered them too. There is nothing special about AI. Data will be pilfered perhaps some or most of the weights or training data, and the LLMs themselves might make it far easier for attackers to do their job at scale, enabling greater productivity of existing practices like phishing. Because such a scenario is virtually inevitable, we should consider the ramifications of such an event and what havoc it might cause to our society. What can happen if GPT-4 or something like it is stolen? If it is openly released. The time is probably coming sooner than you think. All right, everyone, that's it for tonight. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to your channel, sign up for the Patreon, and I'll see you guys next time.